why are we interested in this thing? Now, the most common pattern of this kind is a lens. We have seen already the definition of a lens. Here in programming, we should think of this as I have some complex data structure of type S, and I want to access some subfield of that data structure of type A. And also, if I have a, the complex data structure and a new subfield that should be put in place of that A, I want to get back a new data structure with that updated subfield. For example, if I have a, a postal address, one of the fields will be a street. And if I have a postal address and a new street, I can update, give back the same postal address, but changing the street by, for the new one. So this will be an example of a lens, um, but this is not the only pattern you use in programming. For example, we have prisms also, that would be lenses in the opposite category. This is precisely the wiring diagrams we were seeing before. And the idea in that accessing is if we have some abstract data structure, we try to pattern match it into a, into a type A, but it can fail and return a type T. And for a more complete data structure, we can return a more abstract data structure again. The example, I think, is more clear. If I have a string, I can try to pass the string into a postal address. But that can fail. The string may be not a postal address. So I, I have to be allowed to return either a string or a postal address. And if this time I have a, um, a postal address, I can forget the structure of the postal address and give back a string again. So this is another pattern of, of, of accessing data structures. This is just a lens in the opposite category, so this is not having anything really new. But we have uh, diff other different patterns of this kind. For example, we can deal with multiple foci. Instead of having just one focus, one when I am accessing and thinking about, I have a list of different foci, and I want to put them into a list, and then give a way of, if I give you a new list, <coughs> okay, I can use that to update my, my original data structure. Here we don't kind of do the splitting within a lens into a view and update, because the two lists need to be of the same length, so that quantifies the difference in the splitting. Okay, so ha we have mm, ways of accessing data structures, and we would like to compose them. We would like to have a compositional way of putting them together. If I have, for example, a string and I want to pattern match into a postal address, and now I want to see inside that postal address some subfield, so we'd like to be able to compose them. Composition of these things is easy, it's not difficult, but it's fiddly, it's awkward, it's something that it would be really nice if we don't have to write down. So for example, if I compose a lens or a prism, I could get some formula like this, which is not very illuminating, and I could get something that is neither a lens nor a prism. And that translates into code, again, the code is not difficult, but this code we would prefer not to have to write. So the solution that is uh, given in, in optics libraries, in this data accessor library, is to use something that we call profound color optics. Um, so the idea is that, surprisingly, maybe uh, a lens or a prism can be written equivalently as functions that are um, parametric over profunctors with certain algebraic structure. Algebraic structure is a Tambara module, we are going to discuss that later. But the basic idea is that a lens can be written as a function, a prism can be written as a polymorphic function, and this solves the problem of composition, because now a composition of these things is just function composition. And when I write that into the code, the only thing I am using is function composition, which is actually something that I will have in my library, in my language. I don't need to write the composition explicitly. So we would like to know how, how this is working, how, why this works, um, and how to model all, all of the possible objects in this way. Okay, for example, this is an example from actual code. If I have um, some string, I can access, I can have a, a prism that tries to pattern match this into a postal address, and then I can have a lens, I can compose the lens with the prism, and then I can access a subfield of that, um, can you view, of that, um, of that postal address, and finally, if I, if I update this, because this is all bidirectional, uh, the changes will propagate back into the beginning. So we are going to see first a definition of optic, a general definition of optic. We are going to see how they can be represented as profantor optics, each one of those. How can we compose them? And now we will, to, we will see how can we create, invent our new optic. Um, because we have some optics that come naturally from programming, but now that we have um, general definition, we will be able to see that there are many other cases that follow from, from that natural. So to, to speak about existential optics, uh, our first definition of optics, I need to introduce you to ends and co -ends. This won't be really illuminating if you 
you haven't seen them before, they are equalizers and co-equalizers for, for the left and right action on the profound coronary function. <laughs> but intuitively, we can think of them as, as being sort of universal quantifiers. This would be the end here on top. Um, and the co being some sort of existential quantifiers. Both plus some naturality conditions. This intuition that they are like universal and existential quantifiers plus naturality conditions comes from the fact that we can write natural transformations of an M. The set of natural transformation would be like for all x, I have morphism from fx to jx, to gx, and plus some naturality conditions, which in this case coincide with the naturality conditions that define the natural transformation. Um, because of this, we can in particular write the Yonera lemma as, um, as this um, isomorphism between n sets. And the intuition here is that each time we have an integral of that kind, we can interpret the onset as being something like a Dirac delta. So we are integrating, just substituting each occurrence of x on the formula by an x. And that will be an application of Yonera lemma. Because they are just limits and co-limits, we have continuity of one functions that are really limited. So we are going to use this again and again. We have a nice calculus now of n's and co -ends, and it's a thing we are going to be using to describe our state. So this is the definition of opting now, which is precisely a Cohen. We fix first some monoidal action, which is a strong monoidal functor, from a monoidal category into the category of endofunctors. And then we say that the optic uh, from ST with focus on AB will be to say that we have exist some N in the monoidal category, such that we can split S into M applied to A. And when we have M applied to B, we can get that back into T. I need to uh, now to justify to you that this uh, definition actually captures the example we were, we were talking about. The fact that we cannot access the context is important, and we cannot access the context in the sense that it needs to be natural, you know, it needs to be very natural. And this is the neutrality conditions of the coin to be modeling this, we cannot access the context. So now I need to show you that the examples I gave you at the beginning actually can be captured on this, uh, on this definition. For example, if you have lenses, uh, we are saying that lenses are optics for the product. The idea here is that we write the definition, the first factor to the split because it's a product, and then we apply the Yonera lemma. We're substituting everything you can see that we have on the formula for an S, and we get back the formula for, for, for an S. So we can actually say that lenses are optics in this sense. The same way for prism, the proof is completely dual, just to do coin calculus, we will be splitting on, on the right and then applying Yonera lemma and getting back our formula again. So, and traversal were a bit more difficult because they are um, optics as for the action of polynomi uh, polynomi polynomial functor. Um, so, we want to prove this isomorphism here. So the idea is basically <coughs> the same, but the thing we are doing is applying first continuity, then we are writing that uh, as a natural transformation because it's uh, from a discrete category on the natural numbers to set. This C are functors, so this product is a natural transformation. And then we apply the lemma on that category of, of functors. And the thing we are doing is that we are substituting every occurrence of C there for that in functor there. So we got precisely the formula we have at the beginning for traverse code. Um, in programming libraries, you will get, you will find uh, some characterization of the traversal that is in something called traversable functors but they are also related to polynomial functors by a result of Haskell of O'Connor in 2014. So it's actually the same thing, if you have a look at that. Um, this is nice because all our optics are, can be described <coughs> in this way. All the optics that are usually used by programming libraries are, can be described uh, with this definition. Um, yeah, I have only talked about lenses, prism, and traversal. We have a whole family of, of optics there. So, uh, the next step is to explain how they can be represented uh, with profunctors, with parametric functions of profunctors, and how to compose them. <coughs> so the idea is that we will start by fixing an action now. It could be products to be lenses, it could be a polynomial functors to be traversal. And we consider Tambara modules, which are uh, profunctors and that with a family of morphisms like this, plus some coherence condition. It has to be the natural, it has to behave nicely with the monoidal structure. For all we care right now, they can be described as co-algebra for this particular co-monad here. This particular co-monad has now a left adjoint, which must be a monad, 
And when we compute that left adjoint, we can say that uh, Tambara modules will be or coalgebras for the commonal or al equivalently algebras for the monad. So we are working in the category, the island probability <coughs> category for that monad, or equivalently for the commonal. <coughs> now, this is the perfunctory representation theorem. Once we write it, once we substitute this parametricity on the P for, a, for an N, and we say that optics are functions parametric or Tambara modules in that sense, in the sense that we have an end there, and, and we are forgetting the structure on the P to apply it to both sides of the, of the, of the constituent. Um, now we are going to prove this, and we also are going to get that the category, the optic category associated to adaptation is like a, a full subcategory on the classic category, uh, the full subcategory is representable functors on the classic category for that moment. The proof is just John Edalem again, and using the fact that we can generate freely Tambara modules, because they are algebra, so we can generate the free algebra. And um, the most important part here is that we are going to describe them. So on top you have the profile representation of an optic, then you have the definition we have of an optic. Here in the middle, we have this that can be rewritten as this, because of John Edalem. And this is saying that the category of optics is precisely the subcategory and representable functors of the classic category for the monad. There is also a, a way of, of seeing this, uh, not in CAD, but in PROC, that is maybe a bit more satisfying because in, instead of having to talk about full subcategories on the classic category, we go to PRO functors, we have composition of PRO functors that resembles um, relational composition. I'm not going to stop much here because of time, but the idea is that you have a a uh, by category where the zeros are the categories, we have pro functors at one cells, and we have natural transformations. We can consider monads on that category, uh, sorry, monoids on that by category. And the Kleisley object, which is a formal analog of the Kleisley category here, um, would be a category with the same objects, but now the, the onsets, like we are putting morphisms on top of our previous category, and the onsets are given by the pro monads. Um, so with, for some fixed kind of optics, we can write, we can define our optics category to be the, the Kleisley object for that promona. And we can use now the, the universal property of the Kleisley object to prove again the profound representation theorem. I don't want to bore you with the details here because it's basically the same proof, just in pro. And the thing we get is that they are precisely algebras for those promona, these Tambara modules. So now we have, a, um, we have seen that uh, optics categories can be seen as classic categories. So we have now two notions of composition that should be natural to consider. First, what happens if we have a distributive law between the two monads, then I can put the two classic categories together and work with them. And, second, uh, and secondly, I can also consider the co-product of the two monads and work with that. And the thing that is implicitly done in programming libraries, if you go to, to the lens library in Haskell, for example, is that they work with the co-product of the two components. So the thing that happens when we compose two uh, perfunctor optics in Haskell is the following. We have two perfunctor optics for two given actions, two different potentially monoidal actions, potentially different monoidal actions, alpha and beta, that are given like that. And then we can compose them into a function that is ranging, ranging over uh, functors that have both a Tambara structure for the action on alpha and a Tambara structure for the action on beta. So we will be taking a pullback into the um, in cat to see that we have a pro functor that can be given a, an algebra structure for alpha and a algebra structure for beta. <coughs> it has to be the same pro functor in both, both cases. So this is how has to compose optics, and we are saying with all of this that this time we have a Tambara we can see this is but we can see that each time we have a Tambara structure for alpha and a Tambara structure for beta, the thing we have is a Tambara structure for the co-product of the actions. Where the co-product of the action would be if you have a morphism from end to end, it would be the one given by, by the universal property directly. So for example, if we compose lenses with prisms, I would get the co-product action of the product and the co-product. And that would be a word on sets that are given um, D1 plus, D1 times, D2 plus, D1 times, and that can be as long as I want. It would be maybe for intuition like a, a co-product of monoids. 
Um, so this would be this act this actually instead of considering this, if you go to program leverage, they are considering uh, something of that form because we can distribute all with the product over the sum, and we get back at the end something of that form. Um, this gives an optic that is called a fine traversal, and it's what you will see from in libraries. This is the composition between lenses and. <coughs> With all of this, we can consider now that if we, instead of considering arbitrary monoidal actions, we will consider some notion of subcategory of the category of endotransport. Here we think the nice notion to consider is that of replete subcategories. That are those that are uh, full on isomorphisms, but don't necessarily full. Um, with this, we can limit actions to be just these inclusions of these replete submonoidal categories. We have a, a lattice on this, on this action. And um, this lattice corresponds to a lattice on the on the optic that we have here. So this is all to say that now we have um, a lattice structures on this, a lattice structure on this optic that is telling to me, if I compose uh, a lens with a prism, for example, I will get back an affine. If I compose a lens and a traversal, I will get back a traversal. I'm getting always the joint on the lattice of the two optics I'm considering. Um, Okay, so we have here a family of bidirectional data accessors that are also intercomposable between them. Um, apart from these, that are the ones usually considered in programming libraries, now that we have a definition, we would like to go a further and say, well, let's try to consider what could be new optics that haven't been considered yet. So I'll give you an example of how we could create an optic and try to look for a, for a use for this construction. <coughs> So I'm going to consider applicative functors, which are lax monoidal functors in the in the category of sets, where the monoidal structure is given by the by the Cartesian product. Um, lax monoidal functors can be seen as monoids for the monoids for the for the convolution. And I want to see them as monoids because I want to generate three three monoids here. I want to generate three applicative functors. And we have a formula in general that says if the tensor product uh, distributes over the co-product, we can always generate a free monoidal as this thing here. So we can generate three applicative functors. I have taken a class of functors that is usually used in programming, and I am trying to say that we can generate three, three applicatives, three of that class. That's the only thing we are going to be using here. Because now we can apply general lemma again. We can, this first iso is a consequence of general lemma. Now we can apply the construction of free applicative functors, and we can apply your lemma again to substitute this here. Um, with this, we get a concrete optic. I am calling concrete optic each time that we manage somehow to get rid of the covariance. That is not a process we can do in general, but it's a process we can do in some nice cases. Each time we can construct the free of some class, we can do that. Um, and the same if we can generate co free, co -free um, functors of some form. Okay, so here we have done this for applicative functors and we have get this optic back. And this optic we have been calling a kaleidoscope. And the thing it's doing is that I have a way of folding the focuses of all the of all my a list of a list of focuses into one. I can fold also a list of these structures into one. Now why would like to use this this optic? But the nice thing about optics is that they can be composed also with other optics. We have family of Bidirectional transformations that we want to them to be intercomposable. And I have a problem here because I cannot compose this with a lens, for example. Why cannot I compose this with a lens? Because the product in general is not an applicative functor, and for them to be composable, I would need the action of one of the optics to be included in the action of the other optic. So the product is not in general a, a lacmonoidal functor of the product, but it is when it is a product by a monoid. So let's consider lenses, but instead of being the residual being a product, instead of considering that we are considering the action for the product, let's consider the action for a product for a monoid. And let's see what happens. So instead of ranging now over sets, I'm ranging only over monoids. We can split again, we can construct the free monoid, and we'll get a variant on a lens. This is what uh, we will call list length, which would be basically the same of a lens, but now I'm asking the, the residual, to be a monoid, and because the residual is a monoid, the concrete optic I get at the end is a bit different. So it has a big function, but now the update function takes a list of, of, of big data structures and one 
of the hope is to create one of the big infrastructures. Now, the, the interesting thing about this is that at least lenses can compose with kaleidoscope because the product of by a monoid is a lax monoidal function. So they compose automatically. I don't need even to give you the, the composition, what the composition is, because I can go to the for the presentation of both and compose them as function composition. So let's now try to see what could be a, a, a new case for this thing. For example, we have a, a data set. Even if I'm going to talk a bit about data science, is I think the, the main idea here is not data science. The main idea here is programming and how to make nice like, some composition of data accessors. So this is not about data science. I don't feel this is <coughs> fundamentally about data science. Um, and we can define a lead lens that the thing is doing is implementing some learning algorithm. We can do this because the thing we have here is that if I have in the data set, um, I want to classify some measurements into a species. This is a common data set that is used in data science. I want to be able to project from every point of the data set on the measurements. And if I have a list, I have a complete data set. And some measurements, I want to classify them into a new point of the data set. I can compose that with a, with a kaleidoscope that the thing that we'll be doing is if I give you a way of aggregating a lot of real, then it extends that into a way of aggregating tuples of real. So with that, if I give you a way of aggregating one of the measurements, it extends that automatically to all the measurements. So let's see how the example works. We have a list lens that is implementing some learning algorithm, be nerd nerd or something like that. Um, because it is a lens, every list lens is in particular a lens because every product by a monoid is a product. We can actually use, use it as a lens and access the measurements of our, our first point in the data set. And we, because they are more abstract than a lens, we can uh, actually take some measurements and ask for them to for, for the list then to, to classify them into a new point on our data set. So we, we will be classifying the species. So we have some learning algorithm that we are using there. And the nice thing about this is that we can now compose with a kaleidoscope. I have a kaleidoscope that is aggregating all the measurements. So I can give it a function that aggregates a list of numbers and I get the mean. The thing is doing is like applying the mean over all the data set, getting a new point, and then using <coughs> the lens to classify it into a, into a particular species. So, <coughs> I'm going to, to, to give a summary of everything we have been seeing and what would be have the directions. We have seen that we have a, a lot of bidirectional data accessors that are usually used by programmers. We have a concrete representation of them that is a general definition that captures all of them. From that, we can go to a profanto representation that makes composition easy. And we can compose not only optics of the same kind, but we can compose optics of different kinds and get back a new optic. So we have a family of decomposable optics here. The thing we want to do is to first to extend the, the slightly generalization the definition of optics to something that is called lawful optics that are usually used in programming. And then to consider generalization, because it's a, there is an obvious way of generalizing this. I have been working on sets all the time, but we are not using that is structured that much. So we could take an uh, enrichment over a Cartesian closed and Cartesian closed complete and complete category, which is basically everything we have been using on sets, uh, to repeat the same work. And we can extend the theorems to something called missed optics, where we don't ask the two parts of the optics to live in the same category. And the theorems are generalized easily. That, that we have done, and it's not. It's just writing again the proofs, considering that we have optics in two categories. Um, then we can do implementations of all of this because we have a nice, a nice uh, description of what optics are. We can write more concise libraries of optics, and we have done that uh, in Haskell and then in Agda and Idris. The idea is that in everything we have been done here uh, looks naturally constructed. We are not using square mirror at any point, so everything would be easy to translate to, to a proof assistant and do partial formalization. Also, the coin calculus, as you can see there, is particularly nice to formalize because being almost a formal calculus, um, <coughs> we can just write our derivations and get back the isomorphisms between the two sets. So the thing you can see that this is correct from the right from the derivation. And I think that's all I give you the the to and thank you very much. <laughs>
entire structure. So do you have any size machine? Uh, yeah, probably a lot, a lot of them. And when we work with Guadla, I will talk about this, but I want to. Uh, the thing that we are using there is type on type because we have, a, you will have, I guess you have a lot of size issues. I don't know if they can be fixed. I would hope so, uh, but I haven't tried because this was like the first book and I went with without considering size issues. But yeah, yeah, you have a lot to do. Yeah. Why, why Okay, so let's uh, thank the speaker again.